All right, there are a few different aspects to that, a few different parts to that story. Uh, I grew up in Ann Arbor, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Music usually started in fifth grade. My family happened to be living in England for six months and coming back in October after the school year had already started. So in fifth grade, I watched my two best friends in class get to leave class every now and then when the drum teacher came to the door and motioned them out and said, that looks like a good idea. So I signed up in sixth grade to start, bought the sticks, the rubber practice pad, the instruction book, so on and so forth. Decided to do a little preparation beforehand, sat down, read through the book. This is how notation works, this is what rhythm is. Hadn't had any music to the background before that at all. Uh, said, okay, this all makes sense, I understand it. Did fine up to the roll, and then it was sort of like, oh, I don't quite get that. Went through a year of that basic instruction, was fortunate enough to have an excellent private teacher right off the bat. Uh, and that pretty much carried me into high school. Uh, and then by coincidence, I decided to, to go to the University of Michigan and try music out. And I auditioned for the, for the current professor who has a music education background, wonderful musician. He's the one who taught Gordon from an early age. Uh, and after I auditioned and had been accepted, word filtered down that he was retiring and they were hiring some new fellow from the Philadelphia Orchestra, Charles Owen, who I'd never heard of. And when I showed up at Michigan, Charlie and I hit it off like gangbusters. And it became apparent that why should I, I was, my original plan was to do a year at Michigan or so and then transfer to an East Coast Conservatory so I could study with an orchestra player. And here an orchestra player came to Ann Arbor and I was all set. And then the other side of that is that I had started out on this marimba track. I learned those three from Charity from Charlie. He played them all to Philadelphia. Um, got interested in contemporary music and chamber music, moved more in that direction. Got interested in jazz vibraphone, again, moving in that direction. Um, and one day, uh, Charlie happened to say, well, if the main thing you're... And I enjoyed playing in an orchestra, but I didn't want to audition for an orchestra. <clears throat> and I was focused more on solo marimba. Kate Calave was a big influence. Um, and contemporary chamber music. And there was one day when Charlie just said, well, if you're interested in, in making a career out of contemporary music, you'll have to move to New York. Which had not really been a consideration before that time. Uh, and I ended up sort of rushing my way through school, finishing two degrees in four years, and saying, I'm going to move to New York, and went from there. If I remember correctly, I think it was in 97 or 98, possibly just before I left New York. No, a bit earlier. Because I remember going to see um, some things with drum corps that Eric was doing in Herald Square or something like that in New York. So it must have been slightly before I left New York. Um, but the main impetus, we were, I think it was Eric and I were walking through the hallway at a paycheck at some point, and he just happened to say, why don't you have a signature mail on it? And I said, nobody's asked. And that <laughs> was basically where it started from. So I, I think that I'm technically the second signature artist in the IP. Well, the, the first line of mallets was basically uh, modeled after what I'd been using previously by another manufacturer. Uh, I've always wanted a slightly heavier mallet. I wanted a, a two-tone kind of a mallet. I wanted a synthetic core. Uh, I wanted a fairly soft but durable yarn. Um, mostly I wanted something that was a little bit heavier than what most of the other ones were like. And so that's the, the first line, 501 through 504. Um, those mallets were perfect for solo playing, very good for the whole point of the synthetic core mallet is that you can have a cloud to hide in with the softer dynamics, and as you play louder, the, the core sound starts to get brighter and brighter. So it gives it quite a quite a color range in there. Um, and then I began experimenting more with the rubber core mallets, and I wasn't that satisfied with any other thing that was out there. And I proposed to Chris at one point that we make the same mallets with a rubber core. And again, we went back and forth with some prototypes, uh, and I'm delighted what he came up with. And the, and the real difference is that with a rubber core mallet, as you play louder, you can, first of all, the soft dynamic, you can still have the cloud and, and be able to really hide on some of the soft tremolo kind of stuff. But then as you, as you get louder, it, it stays dark and warm and rich, and it doesn't get quite as bright. So the two versions are, are both very useful, 
in slightly different situations. And I find that I'll switch back and forth depending on the repertoire or the instrument or the hall or whatever the situation happens to be. The one thing that I advise my students is that the synthetic core is more useful for when you're playing solo and not in any kind of a chamber or percussion ensemble or larger ensemble situation where the sort of the background noise of the ensemble masks the soft dynamic level and, and it sort of means that the upper part of your dynamic, dynamic range becomes your only dynamic range. Same thing happens if you're playing a concerto with an orchestra. The orchestra covers up the lower half of your dynamic range and it sounds like you're very restricted because you, you, you seemingly only have half as much dynamic range. Um, so the synthetic chord mallets are more, more suited to solo playing and the rubber chord mallets have a better job in an ensemble situation about giving the instrument presence and a little more uh, increasing the dynamic range that can be useful in that situation. Well, the, uh, in terms of the actual mallet selection, I, I, I'll make a general decision of like, in my case, I'm using the synthetic core or I'm using the rubber core in this particular situation. But then it, it also comes, um, I never use all four of the same mallet if I'm playing rim. I'm always voicing the mallets in one way or another, either A, a, B, 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 or A, 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 B, or A, B, B, C, or some combination like that. So the first thing that I'm always advocating with my students is, yes, there's a period of time when you need to be trying out a lot of different kinds of mallets and so on and so forth. But at some point you have to make a commitment to one line and own every grade of hardness in that line so that you're able to mix and match appropriately to get that kind of voice. And you can't do that if you've got you know, one by company A and another one by company B and another one by company C. It just won't work. It has to, it has to be an integrated line. Uh, and that goes for timpani mallets or for rim mallets or anything like that. Yeah, well this is, if I remember my dates correctly, this is 20 years that I've been working with Innovative Percussion. I, I greatly enjoyed that experience and I thanks to all the people who work there. Um, it's been a, a, a very nice back and forth about developing the things that that I need to work with, um, and also that aspect of my coming in and saying, no, you don't have one of these. What do you think about making something like this? Yeah, I'm still working on that. We'll see how that succeeds. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's a great way to end it, too. <laughs>